Janie, thank you for sharing. Thank you for your example. JT, thank you for the update. I just can't believe that we get to do this together. It occurred to me as JT was giving the, the update that I made a colossal mistake in not having my brother preach today. Um, I just wanted to remain there and hear him bring the word of God. But we are continuing our series in Luke, and I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 3. Each January, we take one Sunday to speak to uh, ethnic harmony and ethnic justice, and then we take another Sunday, and this will be next week, to speak to the sanctity of human life in the womb. And I will tell you, it is rare to find Christians who genuinely value both of those issues the way that Scripture does. And the reason for that, if you want to know, I will tell you, it's because culturally, one passion tends to be associated with the left, and the other passion tends to be associated with the right. But it needs to be said that we do not approach these issues from a political or sociological framework, but from a biblical framework. And our goal is not for our passions to align with any political party, but with the Word of God. And so we, we, speak to, we speak to ethnic harmony from the conviction that the Bible has a lot to say about ethnicity, uh, with the conviction that this fallen world always has been and remains full of ethnic strife, and the conviction that the church of Christ has room to grow in the removal of ethnic and racial divisions in the church and room to grow in displaying the unity that God intends for his people. Our, our conviction as a church, and those of you who have been in the church for decades will know this, our conviction from our earliest days in the 1980s is that there is good and joyful work to be done in the pursuit of ethnic harmony. And so we are going to exposit this passage at the beginning of Luke chapter 3 and then make some application to the theme of ethnicity. Our title is Bear Fruits in Keeping with Repentance. Luke chapter 3. This is God's holy and authoritative word, and I'd like to invite you to please stand for the reading of God's word. Luke 3, verse 1. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Anus and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And 
Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. May God bless the preaching of his word. You may be seated. Whenever a child is born, it's natural for the parents, for the father and mother to wonder what this child will one day be. Will he or she make us proud? Will this child do something with his or her life? Will this, the life of this child be used for the glory of God? Well, Zachariah and Elizabeth had already received answers to some of those questions before their son, John the Baptist, was even born. Earlier in Luke, you may remember in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 16, is where Zechariah was told by an angel of the Lord concerning this child, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. There would be a turning. His ministry would be the ministry of repentance. And it may be that some of you today need to have your lives and your hearts turned to the Lord in repentance. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So there is something of eternal importance that people everywhere needed to be ready for, a people prepared. And John the Baptist was sent for that purpose. After John was born, you may remember, Zechariah praised the Lord and said, and this is in chapter 1, beginning in verse 76, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. And here's what John is doing. To give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God. Whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. What is John doing? He is preparing the way. He is announcing that salvation is coming in the Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone wonders, what will we do about the problem of our sin against God? What hope do we have in this world of darkness and death? How can we find the way of peace Peace in our souls, peace with one another, peace with God. These are the great questions that John the Baptist came to address. Now notice the way that John is introduced. Luke, uh, being the, the faithful, painstaking historian that he is, provides a list of seven rulers in the first two verses there. This is not a myth. This is not a, a nice spiritual story. This is history. 
And in fact, this is confirmed by sources outside of the Bible. There's a, uh, a man by the name of Josephus, a famous first century Jewish historian who wrote for Rome. He was not a Christian, and he wrote about these leaders that Luke mentions, Pontius Pilate, Herod Antipas, Philip. He also, Josephus, wrote about John the Baptist and described his ministry, which reveals the impact of John's preaching and confirms the historicity of the events in this passage. Luke does not spend a lot of time on these great Roman rulers. He could, but he doesn't. And the reason he does not is that there is someone far more important, and he's out in the wilderness. John the Baptist. We know from Matthew 3, verse 4, that John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt, and his food was locusts and wild honey. It's always fun to see what the children's book illustrators do with John the Baptist. And it was around the year 29 AD when, verse 2, the word of God came to John. That formula is of tremendous significance. That is the same phrase, the same wording that we see with the Old Testament prophets hundreds of years earlier. Jeremiah 1, Ezekiel 1, Hosea 1, the word of God came. And so these these great and powerful leaders who are mentioned in the first two verses are in fact only the backdrop of the main event, which is the word of God and the proclamation of the word of God to sinners like you and me. There is a word that has come. And praise God that he is a speaking God who has made himself known in his word. This is, this is one reason that a gathering like this today, the people of God, is more important than any gathering of political or national leaders. Here, when the word of God is opened, is when we can say, in a sense, the word of God has come. The word of God addresses us through his word and makes himself known. You know what our greatest need is today? The word of God. The word of God. And the message that John preached is the same message that we need today. And the word of the Lord comes to us today through John, who though he is dead, still speaks to our hearts through the words that Luke records in this passage. Though John is dead, he points to one who is not dead. He is preaching of one who is not dead, and the truth he proclaims is not dead, but is life for our souls. And so we look, let's take a closer look here at the time that we have, at the components of this message from God, the Word of God in Luke chapter 3. It is the message we need today. Three points, okay? A declaration of good news, a warning of divine judgment, And then a call to real repentance. First, a declaration of good news. It's clear not only from the infancy prophecies that we just saw, but also from this passage that John is a herald of good news. Verse 3 says that he went into the wilderness region proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So he is preaching to address the whole problem of sin that plagues humanity. He was baptizing people in the wilderness as an outward sign of repentance and salvation and the forgiveness of sins, which is why Christ came into the world. He was pointing to Christ as that one who came to die in our place so that we might be forgiven of our many sins. You may remember that John In John chapter 1, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming to him and he proclaims in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's why he came, to deal with the problem of sin. And this, friends, is good news. The best news, in fact, the world has ever heard. That's the message that John came preaching. Later in Luke 3, it it, He speaks of Jesus. We'll see that in the following weeks. And then it says in verse 18 of chapter 3, So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. 
He's bringing a message of good news. Luke says in verses 4 through 6 that John is the fulfillment of that voice in the wilderness that was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40. Those words are referenced here to communicate that every obstacle that would stand in the way of the salvation of sinners will be overcome. Nothing can stand in the way of God's plan to save. Valleys will be filled. Mountains will be laid low. And salvation will reach the ends of the earth. And in fact, verse 6 says this very thing. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. All flesh meaning not just ethnic Jews, but all flesh. So Luke is again reminding us here of the global reach of the gospel. All flesh means all ethnicities, all peoples from nations throughout the world will experience the glorious salvation that Christ has brought. There is good news that John proclaimed and that we proclaim today that there is Hope for sinners because there is a God who saves. Now the second aspect of this message that John brings is a warning of divine judgment. (laughs) There's a section of John's preaching that is recorded here in Luke 3. And here John is, as they say, coming in hot. Uh, His words in verses 7 through 9 do not seem to be especially winsome. And yet they, they have their intended effect, which is the awakening of sinners to the danger of our situation. And what's important for us to understand, friends, is that this is an essential aspect of gospel preaching. The good news cannot be reduced to God loves you, come to Jesus. There, there must be, as part of coming to Jesus, repentance, and the conviction of sin, and fleeing the judgment we deserve. I have spent time this week with John the Baptist, and I am convinced that we need more of this kind of holy boldness and directness today. The crowds come to be baptized by him, and he calls them a brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee The wrath to come. In other words, he says, you want to be baptized, but do you really understand what I am doing? Do you understand this message of salvation? Do you understand the peril of your situation? Brood of vipers. Wrath of God. And there was not anything that was especially and uniquely bad about these crowds. In fact, the lesson here for us is that we are all, every one of us, a brood of vipers. We are all naturally dead in our trespasses and sins, following the ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan. That is how we come into this world And every one of us have been or are there today. There's a problem in how we view ourselves that this passage corrects. A lot of people today are taught to see themselves fundamentally as those who have been wronged by others rather than those who have done wrong. And the problem is that we are all naturally self-deceived about how good we are. I'm not so much a viper goodness i am more like a mini golden doodle that's the pet why we have a mini golden doodle henry i'm like a a mini gold sometimes i can be a bit cheeky but i'm i don't harm anyone i'm i am the moral equivalent of a of a mini golden doodle no this passage says we are we are snakes and sinners and because god is holy We all deserve the wrath that is to come. John uses this image of 
divine judgment to press home this point. Even now, he says, the ax is laid at the root of the trees. There are, there are trees that will be cut down and thrown into the fire. It is, it is a warning. Here is John the Baptist preaching by the river, pouring out his heart and soul, warning people to flee the judgment that is to come. There is a God who judges sin. We will be and are accountable to this God. And because we are sinners all, we deserve his righteous judgment against sin. There is a warning here about the reality of hell. God himself is warning us today. God is awakening sinners to the severity of our situation. This, this might not sound like good news. I, I'm, we're bringing good news today. You are a brood of vipers who deserve eternal judgment. But it's part of the good news. And, and I know it's difficult news, but listen, you can't celebrate the good news until you confront the bad news. And the most loving and gracious and merciful thing God can do is to be honest with us about the predicament of our souls. And so John, John is willing to say things that he knows are offensive Things that will get him canceled. Things that will get him killed. He's willing to, to say it because he cares enough about their souls and their eternal flourishing. The, the bad news needs to be confronted before the good news. I was reminded earlier as we're praying for the Spirit of God to be poured out of a passage that Luke records in Acts chapter 3 from the preaching of the Apostle Peter. In Acts 3, verse 20, there is a call to repentance. This same repentance. Repent, but then it says, there's this glorious phrase that you may experience times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. If we as a church, if you individually want to experience times of refreshing, if you want to experience a life of flourishing and blessing now and for all eternity, the reality of sin must be confronted. We must be honest about who we are. We, naturally, a brood of vipers who deserve only judgment. That is the way to salvation and hope and joy. Now, John also gives, and you may have noticed this, a warning against ethnic presumption and ethnic pride. A warning against relying upon our ethnic heritage. In verse 8, he says, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. That's a warning. Do not rely on your ancestry, your upbringing, your connections, religious heritage, cultural heritage. Phil Reich in comments on these verses says, some of them had a spiritual pride that was based on their ethnic identity. That was the reality. And so John says to them, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. God can raise up people of any ethnicity from anywhere in all of the earth to be his own. Daryl Bach calls it a warning that ethnic heritage alone is not good enough to escape God's wrath. It is the, it is the tendency of fallen humanity to boast in our ethnicity, to rely on our cultural or religious heritage and to see ourselves as superior to others. We have Abraham as our father, they said. And John essentially says, well, if you had known Abraham better, you would have known that God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3 included a plan of a multi-ethnic people from every nation to be redeemed and united in Christ. Flee the judgment that is to come and don't do it in a way that relies upon ethnic, cultural, religious heritage. Now, after preaching sin and wrath, the crowds are then responsive 
and they say, verse 10, what then shall we do? In other words, this is what John's going to answer here. What does it look like to trust Christ and to follow Him? You want to know what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? John continues then, and this is our last point, the third point, a call to real repentance. This is verses 11 through 14. What John is describing in these verses is the fruits in keeping with repentance, as he says earlier. This is, please understand, this is not what we do to be saved. That is to trust Christ and his finished work alone, to not rely on any of our good works or our moral performance for acceptance with God and the forgiveness of our sins. No, we rely on Christ. But this is a description of what salvation produces in our lives. God calls us to real repentance. What do the repentant look like? What does it mean to be a repentant person? The repentant know that they are sinners who deserve the coming judgment of God. The repentant are aware of their great need for mercy and they are aware of how mercy has come in Jesus Christ. The, the, repent, the repentant have a tenderness about them and a brokenness about them. They are simultaneously grieved by their great sin and at the same time overwhelmed with joy and astonishment at the salvation that God has freely given in Christ. And the repentant experience a degree of real life change. They, they live in a different way. Society then, as now, was full of injustices. And John declares and teaches that coming to Christ means turning away from sin, turning away from corruption, turning away from exploitation. A different way of living is required. There are three categories of people in the text who repent. It is the crowds, the tax collectors, and the soldiers. And in each case, repentance involves justice in relationships and in society. The crowds in verse 11 are commanded to, so that, this is the command, what does it look like to follow Jesus? Be generous with those who have less by sharing clothing, by sharing food. The tax collectors then, second, in verse 12, are to turn from greed, collect no more than what is due. Wealth must never be acquired dishonestly or through the mistreatment of others. And then third, the soldiers, these were law enforcement, they're told in verse 14 to avoid misusing their power, which those in positions of authority can easily do. No fraud or extortion, no intimidation tactics, no unjust use of force, no false accusations. Their, their authority must not be abused, but rather, and I personally know and thank God for several faithful police officers who do this well, rather they are to honor Christ in their work and in their interactions with others. So how does genuine repentance show itself? It shows itself in how we treat fellow image bearers. That's the teaching of John's preaching and the teaching of this text. Daryl Bach summarizes with this. If one asks what a transformed life looks like, the simple answer here involves treating people with generosity in meeting their needs and in refusing to abuse authority. In other words, a transformed life transforms our way of relating to others. Be generous. Be loving. Meet the needs of others. Seek to remedy social injustices. Treat all fellow humans fairly. That is the way of repentance that John proclaims and that the gospel of Jesus Christ demands. Now let me close by making application, and I hope it is obvious that this passage does have profound implications and applications in the realm of ethnicity because, sadly, a lack of consideration and kindness as well as hostility and great injustice has often found expression 
across ethnic lines. The white owner of Frederick Douglass would, as the biography I was recently reading described, would gather the family for Bible reading and hymn singing on Sunday and then beat Douglas on Monday. It is a tragic failure to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And we see the same root of that sin today. Where there is anti-Semitism on campuses, there is a failure to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Wherever people embrace that vision of nationalism that emphasizes the goodness of one's own ethnicity to the exclusion and mistreatment of others, that rising nationalism on the right that promotes ethnic separation and makes an idol of ethnic identity, wherever that is embraced, there is a failure to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And, and throughout history, And today, the world is filled with bad fruit in the realm of how different ethnicities treat each other. And the selfishness and the sin goes both ways. No ethnicity is exempt. But do you know what it is that makes all the difference in our lives and the opportunity that we have as a church to be a counterculture, to be a witness to something more glorious. What makes all the difference in our lives is the love of God revealed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the way this happens is that only the gospel can address the root of ethnic hostility. Only the gospel can address the root of ethnic conflict. Only the gospel, all of the solutions of this world are on the surface compared to the work that the gospel gets done. Only the gospel can triumph over the pride that looks down on the ethnic other or views one's own ethnicity as inherently superior. Only the gospel can triumph over the bitterness that refuses to forgive. Only the gospel can triumph over the selfishness that disregards the concerns of other ethnicities and looks mostly to the interests of our own tribe. Only the gospel can triumph over the greed that pursues gain at the expense of others. Only the gospel can triumph over the the sinful apathy that is indifferent to the pursuit of ethnic harmony. This is what the gospel does. And praise God, there is a grace that has come that is greater than all of our many sins. Grace that changes hearts. Grace that brings unity in Christ and that guides our feet into the way of peace. I want to share with you what John Piper says about greed in connection to ethnicity and ethnic harmony, since greed is what John the Baptist preaches against in our passage. John Piper has had a lifelong passion for ethnic harmony. He is an example to pastors and churches everywhere in this regard. Piper used to live across the highway from a Christian university where interracial dating was forbidden until the year 2000. And when he was growing up, he attended an all-white Baptist church that passed a resolution that blacks would not be able to attend. Piper has preached on ethnic harmony and wrote a book in 2011 called Bloodlines that addresses this issue from God's Word. And one of the things that Piper says is that greed and covetousness is one of the great roots and causes of ethnic strife in the world today. It was decades ago that the Piper family bought a duplex in a poor, diverse area in Minneapolis, and the popular thinking at that time was that this was not a good investment. This was not where people move to, it is where people move away from. But what Piper said as people raised those kinds of questions is that money is not the issue, ministry is the issue, and the glory of Christ is the issue. And he wrote this, he says, if greed were not part of the American landscape, race relations would be dramatically different. The desire to be rich is morally and socially catastrophic. 
Black and white race relations in America were plunged into ruin and destruction the day the first slave arrived in America, kidnapped for white gain against God's law. And greed has driven the ruin and destruction of race relations ever since. And the greed in black hearts is no different from the greed in white hearts. Our shared sinfulness simply expresses itself in different ways according to our circumstances. And then he says, there is only one way to be free from greed for the glory of God. What is it? Faith in the gospel of Christ. And Piper says the reason for this is that it is because it is by faith that we find our security not in wealth, but in God himself. And it is by faith that we declare, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. And it is by faith that we give generously to others and store up treasures not in earth, but in heaven. And Piper says then, the racial landscape in America and the little patch of it where you live will change in ways you cannot even imagine to the degree that you are freed from the desire to get rich and replace it with a desire to serve others. Covenant Fellowship, church family, just as you are doing, continue to bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And let every individual soul here today know that a day is coming when the wrath of God will be poured out upon every unrepentant sinner. That day is coming and my hands are innocent of the blood of any who are here because you have been warned, not just by me, but by God himself in his word. Eternal judgment is coming. And this message comes not as bad news, but fundamentally as good news. Why? Because there is salvation. Salvation today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. There is salvation in his name. And what matters when it comes to being accepted by God is not your ethnicity, is not your upbringing or any of that. It is by relying on Christ alone who is the savior of all peoples. He came into the world to create one new man, to create a new multi-ethnic people bound not by nationality or language or culture, but bound by his blood. And he calls all of his people everywhere to bear fruit in keeping with repentance by walking in love and unity and generosity and justice until he returns. May we be that kind of church, a church that bears fruit in keeping with repentance for the glory of Christ our Savior. I want to invite the band to return as I pray. Our services normally go till 1130 or 1145. We are not yet over, but we're about to go over because I want to sing a song in close. Let's pray together as we prepare our hearts to sing. And please stand with me. Oh, Father, we ask that you would lead us on the joyful road of repentance, just as you have caused us to see a sight of our sin and your holiness. Would you do that now for every person here? Lord, we thank you for looking upon us as a brood of vipers and showing your mercy and your kindness and giving us a way of salvation. You have been so good to us. You have been so merciful and gracious to us and it is because of you and your grace that we are united as one new man in Christ to lift our voices in a song, a song of unity, a song of joy, a song of praise to the God of our salvation. You are worthy to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen.